a research professor in the computer science department. And today we have a Dr. Mark Lofquisk uh, in as a candidate for a research professor appointment in our department, who will give a lecture on some of the work that uh, Mark leads that I do a little bit of work with him in this regard. But uh, I won't spoil anything. Let me just quickly give a brief bio for Mark because he does do research and teaching here already at the university. Mark is a member of the Wireless Interdisciplinary Research Group, or WIRG, at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Dr. Lovkus works as a research associate with the WIRG and as an adjunct professor teaching Cyber or CSCI 5200 Introduction to Wireless Systems course. Mark is also writing the online MSCS Coursera courses entitled Spectrum Fundamentals, and the second course is Spectrum Management and Policy. Those will be available this spring online. Mark, in his day job, works as the Chief Engineer at the Aerospace Corporation, an FFRDC, Federal Funded Research and Development Center, helping the DOD to manage spectrum, predict interference conditions, and recommend policy prescriptions for spectrum access. Marker, Mark is a former Defense Department lead and founder of the National Advanced Spectrum and Communications Test Network, also known as NASTIN, which is a joint defense and commerce department with spectrum testing capabilities. He received his PhD in technology, cybersecurity, and policy here at the University of Colorado in Boulder, and both his master's and bachelor's degree in E at Virginia Polytechnic and State University, also Virginia Tech, from Blasburg, Virginia. Mark, we're looking forward to your presentation. Over to you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so I put together a few slides of some of the types of material I teach in my intro to wireless class. But I'm going to assume you don't know much about spectrum. So I'm going to back up a little bit, like to the Big Bang, for example, jump forward to the 1800s, bring us up to 5G telephony, which is kind of modern days, and show you some considerations that should be done when making these billion dollar spectrum allocation decisions. So I have two separate topics, one of which is kind of new, but the uncertainties, a treatment for measurement uncertainties and uncertainties in spectrum interference predictions. If we're gonna allocate or change service rules for spectrum, uh, we have to determine whether or not we're gonna interfere with existing ones. So in treating those interference predictions, I'm recommending looking at all the uncertainties and variabilities that could exist. The second topic will be smart contracts for spectrum sharing. This is a recent topic for me. I was just looking into, I'm not a smart contracts expert, but I think there's a good fit here. And I thought I'd bring it up as a topic to show you this could be the future. And yeah, we'll see how. So someday that'll say, Professor Mark. Yeah, we'll see. Thanks. All right, so like I said, I'm gonna bounce around the timeline just a little bit. I guess I'll start at 1999. Uh, spectrum dependent systems, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, General Justice from the Army uh, said, a soldier, a radio per soldier, every soldier will be connected. DOD kind of lost its mind. We have to buy a radio for every single soldier. Meanwhile, in 1999, I'm walking around with two spectrum dependent systems. I had the cool holster for my StarTech flip phone and my Alpine aftermarket security system for my car. And fast forward to 2023, timeline bouncing around. There's 12 to 15 spectrum dependent systems on my person. My pen for my iPad has a radio in it. My keychain has multiple radios. My watch has a GPS, cell phone radio, Bluetooth, a 13.42 near field transceiver to buy things with radio, 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 spectrum dependent systems. So this is what's in my pocket. <laughs> and if we went around the room, we could find 400 radios in this room, I guarantee it. So yeah, me too. I can't live without these devices. So <laughs> little ACDC song reference there. Bottom line up front. Sorry, I don't know how to move that bar out of there. I should know how. 
uh, I can't move. It's not on this screen. <laughs> Pardon. I'll read the titles out loud. That'll be on audio too. So the electromagnetic spectrum. This is a multi-dimensional landscape exploited by a myriad of services. This is man-made exploitation of the electromagnetic spectrum. We use it for predicting weather, doom scrolling through our social media sites, defending the nation, detecting missiles, little things like that, <clears throat> exploring the universe with radio telescopes. It is um, the services and the economies that have grown from wireless services. We have a whole course on that, so that's, the economy and um, expansion and growth of wireless services is only bounded by our imagination. So in the rest of the slide, I'll talk about the origins of spectrum, the current trends of use, <clears throat> spectrum sharing, and then I'll go over that informed spectrum management decisions using measurements and continuums of values. That's that uncertainties and variabilities I was talking about. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm trying to prevent coffee. <laughs> so this is the way spectrum is allocated now. Um, it's very hard to read, a little bit of an eye chart here, but each of these colors represent different services. I'm gonna talk over this service. This is radio navigation, this is radar, this is space exploration. Each one of those colors talks about a little difference in service or use. And you'll notice some of these slivers are stat uses. And I love showing this chart to students because this is the first introduction to logarithm. So that bar that's being pointed to, that's 2.7 megahertz wide. And the bar down here is 270,000 megahertz wide. So this is a log chart. So the difference in widths, you know, one of these small rectangles, the whole width of that top bar, for example. So they're not getting compressed. There's just more bandwidth available as a percent of center frequency. Back when the first cell phone came out, it was 832 megahertz. There were 666 FM channels next to each other. And in Washington, D.C., you tried to make a phone call, you just got a busy signal. You were waiting for someone else to hang up before you could access it. Today's phones, and this isn't even dated very well, I think that's an iPhone with a button on the bottom. Um, today's phones, although I did that for this, or even going up into millimeter waves, but they have multiple radios inside of them. They access spectrum swaths and swaths of it in the L band, all the way down to 600 megahertz, where some repurposed analog TV channels used to exist, um, above the Wi Fi signals, <clears throat> up in the uh, close to six gigahertz. <clears throat> and this band, which we'll talk about in a moment, was auctioned off for 86 billion dollars by the commercial carriers, the Verizon, the AT&T, the T-Mobile. They thought it worth a good business decision to invest $86 billion in spectrum licensing. Now they have to build out a network, <laughs> buy a bunch of base stations, antennas, fiber optic cables, billions and billions of dollars. So I argue if these are big, important decisions, treat it that way. <laughs> Consider all the variables. Here's a couple new bands that have been added to 5G and uh, the iPhone 15 is gonna have a lot of millimeter wave bands in it. So that's coming if they're not all sold out by now, but up in the 26 gigahertz, 39 gigahertz, 28 gigahertz, all those have been auctioned off as well. Okay, back in time again. <laughs> so the first purposeful the origin of accessing the spectrum is what that said. <laughs> Purposeful emissions. I want to exploit this resource. I want to jiggle the electrons on purpose for a purposeful function. And they use wireless tele telegraphy. I don't say that word much, sorry. In 1874. And I like to think that that broadcast is still going. It left the earth. 127 years ago. So it's traveled 127 light years from the earth. So it's about a sixth of the way to Betelgeuse, which scientists say may have already exploded. We just haven't seen it happen yet, but I'm not sure we'll get there in time. But so 
just think about it that way. These emissions are traveling at the speed of light and somebody who's looking at us searching for intelligent um, existence, they're gonna see that transmission first, followed by the honeymooners and all in the family up to, yeah, you guys. <laughs> so, copy. So the electromagnetic spectrum, there were radiations in it anyway. <laughs> Not just man-made, just the, that's supposed to be an atom. <laughs> just the thermal agitation of electrons, just electrons moving because they have heat, because they have a temperature, they're agitating randomly and they're emitting, they're emitting energy into this band. And um, we can model that, sort of a feminine equivalent resistor to the noise and a V squared makes it power and thanks to Ludwig Boltzmann, um, who invented the constant for this by dividing two phenomena he measured. Um, if it's one hertz of a bandwidth at a temperature of 300 Kelvin, which is room temperature, um, it's already oscillating at negative 174 dBm per hertz. So that is energy that already exists. That's our noise floor. That is a function of the electrons agitating at a certain temperature, given a certain bandwidth. So what does bandwidth mean? So are you looking at one hertz? That doesn't make sense. Well, I'll give you some examples. <laughs> so just a skinny sliver of 180 kilohertz, 180,000 kilohertz, the noise floor goes up because it's dBm per hertz. <laughs> and uh, that's one LTE resource block. So if you're making a phone call and your phone's not doing anything else, that's the sliver of spectrum that you're using. Back in 2G, second generation cell, cell phone telephony, there were 200 megahertz channels in Europe called GSM, and that was the noise bandwidth there. And now we'll just jump up to one gigahertz. That's the noise, oh, that's a lot. Negative 184 is a big difference from negative 174. The noise floor across a wide band of frequencies is actually pretty high. So if we want to exploit that spectrum, we want a signal to purposefully tra travel from one space to another, it's gotta be louder than that noise floor, right? <laughs> that's called like a signal to noise ratio. Let's, let's look at that for a second. That says accessing the spectrum at the top. <laughs> so at the bottom, signal to noise ratio per bit is measured in decibels. And over on the left side is probability that you're gonna get an error when I'm transmitting something to you digitally. So a nice, a nice line to draw, a horizontal line at 10 to the minus five, that means one out of every 100,000 bits is an error. And if I wanted to use this purple modulation, I'm gonna to have to have almost 30 dB of signal to noise ratio. That signal better stick out of that pretty loud already noise floor by almost 30 dB in order to get one out of 100,000 errors. So I've got to be much louder than the noise floor. <clears throat> 30 dB is a thousand times more power. What 30 means. <clears throat> and in different modulations, it can be a little less, but you can't send as much data through. For example, this QPSK line, which is the dark blue all the way on the left, I can send two bits for every symbol, two bits of information. I'll send you a 10 or a zero, zero or a zero, one. And if I use a different modulation, I need more signal noise ratio, but I can send more bits every time. I'm sending you entire words here. Um, that's four, so two to the two, <laughs> two to the four, two to the six, et cetera. And this is what Starlink's gonna use. It's pretty amazing. They're gonna have low earth orbit satellites, miles and miles above us. They're just gonna have that 30 dB of signal noise ratio. So the spectrum's getting crowded. It's getting louder. It's getting more and more width of bands. Um, current spectrum trends. So how do we allocate those licenses? There's several techniques. We have a whole spectrum management class on this topic. And it used to be first come, first serve. You'd sleep on the steps of the Capitol waiting to get a spectrum license. Then it was, who's the most technically competent to manage that spectrum or use that spectrum and access that spectrum? So... Um, uh, what's his name? Lyndon Johnson's wife owned a TV station because she was the most technically competent person to own 
to be uh, licensed in the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, but in the 90s, we tried our first auction. And we took a cell phone band, it was just this little skinny sliver, 901, 902 megahertz for the uplink, 930, 931 for the downlink, another downlink band. And they sold that license access at auction. Companies like VoiceStream, and which became T-Mobile, Verizon, Sprint. There were, in total, there were 29 bid bidders with small business set aside, et cetera. And it raised $600 million. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Went in, into the treasury, the US treasury to help balance the budget. That was about $200 million per megahertz back in 1994. And those are thin slivers of spectrum. So by 2022, I don't think there's been many auctions this year. I may need to update that. Um, there's been 100 auctions since then. 10 megahertz channels. There were 4,000 licenses auctioned off. Those are regional little um, C, ZCTA, so market areas, zip code tabulation areas um, is what divided up those licenses. And they were auctioned off for $22.4 billion. So these are serious numbers. But then again, look at the ratio, it's pretty similar. It's about $220 million per megahertz at this higher band. <clears throat> yeah, Cherry, well, I never heard of them before. <laughs> they were big bidders. So this dollar per megahertz isn't a ratio that holds true for those higher, higher frequencies due to that sort of compression, how the percent bandwidth is much smaller. <laughs> for example, the um, 20, 30 meg, uh, gigahertz band just auctioned off for only $7 billion, measly $7 billion. That's $2,000 per megahertz for the millimeter width. It's a little bit harder. The whole lot more waves have to happen before it hits your device. Therefore, it's attenuated by much more. Your build out is much greater. So higher frequencies, <clears throat> much more bandwidth is available. In fact, 3.4 gigahertz was available in that band. Um, but it's not worth as much because it's harder to build out. So before I get into my spectrum interference, um, is there a question? Can I ask you, now? you can ask me now. Go ahead, so, sir. At higher bandwidths, don't you have at higher frequencies? Don't you have? Isn't it harder that you will short that short frequency that are short? So that you're costing and costing them, and you can't get to get that half larger part of that. At higher frequencies, like the millimeter waves, I'm going to try and rephrase yeah. or um, regurgitate. Um, uh, the bandwidths are wider because of percent bandwidth, right? The higher carrier frequency means the percent bandwidth is higher. So are you saying you would need bigger guard bands between different blocks of spectrum in the millimeter wave? Was that your question? Speaking of now, the more complex between the smaller that cost reduction. Exactly, that's what I was gonna say. Yeah, your, your intuition was 180 degrees off at first. Yeah, exactly. So they can be tighter together because they won't interfere with each other as much. Um, I, I get into this in my class, but I like to think of it uh, one megahertz, it's only one wave before it reaches you, but 10 gigahertz, it's gonna be a thousand times more waves before it hits you. And each one's a little bit quieter than the last. So propagation is harder, but I can add more antenna elements because an antenna only needs to be this big at 26 gigahertz. So I can add a thousand antenna elements and get more gain that way. But now it's directional. So, sorry, a little bit of valuation of the millimeter wave band. Um, it's hard. <laughs> so um, interference predictions, we're gonna have to think about, like you said, guard bands, how close together can we pack these things? This almost leads into this slide right here. This is spectrum spatial reuse. Sorry about that block up there. Um, Way back when we had regular analog um, broadcast TV, I want to use channel eight in Pennsylvania. I think that's Pennsylvania. I can't reuse that frequency until it's attenuated so much that there won't be interference. You won't be listening to two different channel eights at the same time, seeing two phantom images on your TV. So I can't use it again until I get over to Michigan. And then I can't use it again until I get over to Utah. So 
This is how big the footprints were for broadcast TV. This six megahertz of spectrum, that's the width of a TV channel. <clears throat> you get a few of them across the entire country. And then we came out with cellular telephony. And this is, I get to use frequency A, B, C, D. I, I blocked up those voice channels I was talking about before. And I can reuse it just in the next neighborhood over. It doesn't broadcast as far. So my spatial reuse went from many states to many streets. <clears throat> and today with millimeter wave, I can reuse frequencies in the same room. I can point very directionally to you at 26 gigahertz and reuse it again over here. They won't interfere with each other because there's <clears throat> so much attenuation between them and directionality due to the antennas. Oh, sorry, 1950s, 1990s. <laughs> Gotta keep my timeline going here. We're getting up to the present. <laughs> um, yeah, so the future is smaller and smaller cells. We went from macro cells, which was kilowatts, all the way down to femto cells, which will just be in the watts and that's it. I drive down Denver, every other city street has a lamppost that has a cell radio on top of it. Every street corner, every other street corner. So if they're all right next to you, you walk by base station, base station, base station, it's easy to get those higher signal noise ratios I was talking about. I can send a lot more data that way. Better frequency reuse, I can reuse channel A from one block to the next. It's more secure that way. I'm not broadcasting in all directions at once for many miles. I'm just broadcasting down a city block. And your UE, sorry, that never, never let me get an acronym up there without defining it. A UE is user equipment. That's your smartphone. If all you have to do is broadcast to the street light posts, your smartphone doesn't have to work very hard compared to it's got to go many neighborhoods out. Your phone will get hot, hike up Pikes Peak and it's burning in your hand. I don't know if you're done. <laughs> so um, with this cluster and uh, user density increase and in all these cell towers, you can end up with a smart city. Every parking meter will reset when you drive away, thereby maximizing their profit. <laughs> um, uh, red light goes out right away. The city knows the smart city. It has a cell radio. It tells you the condition of the lights, of the traffic. Um, IoT, Internet of Things, all of your um, natural gas tanks report how much gas is left, things machine to machine. Uh, v to X is vehicle to everything. My car is going to talk to the stoplight. It's going to know that that light is red. It's going to know if a car is coming around the corner, <clears throat> even when you can't see it. Um, so in the future, a base station in every hallway, base stations the size of these cell phones that we already carry around in every single room. That would be even better, right? So you heard it here first. That's uh, <laughs> possibly the trend. And uh, I try to picturize all these things. <clears throat> these guys are getting smaller and smaller. <laughs> right? Doing okay in time. And that brings me to what all these services, everybody's got 27 radios on them. The bandwidths are getting wider. We're going up to millimeter wave. I say we need a framework to analyze whether or not you're going to have interference. And this was in my dissertation, but I'm only going to focus in on one block in the next few slides. It's right inside of here. These two things. So what I like to do is describe the systems that you care about come up with some KPIs. Not everybody measures success in the spectrum the same way. Uh, a radio observatory says, I can watch Beetlejuice explode. That's what they care about. I care about my YouTube videos when I'm driving home. <clears throat> oh, my kids, sorry. sorry to um, wireless headsets, you care about your VR, 3D video performance, all these types of services. So those are your KPIs, your key performance indicators, will be different across different systems. <clears throat> So identify those, know those, weight those, that's what the small w is, and then pass it through a spectrum coexistence testing. And there's already standards for this. The ANSI body of standards wrote C63.27, which is a spectrum coexistence test framework. And they do have even measurement uncertainties. When you're setting up a test um, in a laboratory, for example, you'll use test equipment and write on the label, 
this Agilent Spectrum Analyzer says accuracy plus or minus one dB. Put that in what you're reading. <laughs> if you're looking for changes in power, make sure it fits inside your measurement uncertainty budget. budget. <clears throat> And, and convolve those values together. And then I'm going to focus in on another uncertainty called the variabilities. Then do your analysis and present your summary to regulators. Seems simple enough, but this is not how it works right now. <laughs> it should. So let me zoom in on this guy. Again, that says the interference analysis framework. Yeah, you can see that. What is that little button? Focus that button. Uh, yeah, it won't click. It's just advanced systems. Sorry, guys. There we go. And I advanced too far. Oops. Well, yeah, spoiler alert. That's what path loss looks like. <laughs> so I clicked ahead by accident. All right. So, yeah, let's focus in on this guy. I, I kind of define those blocks. Um, the response variables, the most important response variables, we'll call KPIs. We'll do standards-based coexistence testing and including what's involved, the uncertainties and variabilities. And uh, that's what's new and novel, sadly, about this approach. These are billion dollar decisions on who gets to use what spectrum, how, <laughs> and are you gonna interfere? So do the math. <laughs> so variability, variability, variability. Here's a demonstrated by Path loss using observational studies. This measurement was done back in the 60s where I put a known transmitter in a city and I drove away from that known transmitter going in between buildings and I drove around and around and around and I measured linear distance and path loss is supposed to be a function of distance, right? And if you draw a little visual line where the one kilometer of transmitter receiver separation it could either be almost negative 70, I'm sorry, 70 dB of path loss all the way up to 120 dB of path loss. That's a 50 dB difference if you're one kilometer away. 50 dB, that's 100,000 fold in power. You're either hearing one watt or 100,000 watts. That's what 50 dB means in the log terms. So path loss, function of distance, right now, the FCC just does n equals two, one over distance squared, d to the n, where n equals two. They use free space path loss in their predictions of interference or effects on other users. And I did think it was funny that the purpose of this says it shouldn't be two, it should be 2.7. <laughs> and first standard deviation, 68% of the time, you're gonna have an uncertainty of 11.8 dB, 22 dB is 100 fold. So anyway, <clears throat> and measurement uncertainty is typically treated as um, two standard deviations above and below. That's from uh, NIST measurement science. So I did drive testing, walk testing. I, I run a lot, I did a lot of running testing and I measured my own. So this is just leaving an E node B, walking, running, biking, driving, put them all together. And uh, it's very uncertain. I can't just simply draw that N equals two, that one over R squared. So if I realize that the top button or point is harmful interference, but look at all the occurrences. 99% you know, of the time, I'm well beneath that. So I used... Measurement uncertainty techniques. Measurement uncertainty is um, a real science called metrology, which is measurement science. I use the practices of measurement uncertainty to include those sort of path loss measurements. So the plot you saw before was actually negative 144 dB of path loss with a single standard deviation of 8.9 dB. <coughs> Excuse me. So if I consider that, uh, this is my receive, and the transmit's over there with a test waveform. So the output power is zero dBm, that's one milliwatt, plus or minus one dB. So you have to complete the sentence. Don't say one milliwatt. Tell me what the range of uncertainty would be. It's written on the test equipment. You can guess it for cables, plus or minus 0.05 dB. 
because I didn't torque it right or I torqued it too much. And so in order to measure the received power at test point one, consider those distributions of each of those parts. Some are Gaussian, some are uniform. So I'm going to, in this case, I use Monte Carlo simulation, just a for loop, like keep going around, <clears throat> trying the different values in that measurement uncertainty path. But I included field measurements of path loss in this block, because <laughs> that's what it's going to see in the real world, right? So instead of using negative 144 dB of path loss, what's my answer? I use negative 144 dB plus or minus 8.9 dB. And now I can tell people about probabilities. 50% probability, the output power is negative 134 and below. 99%, uh, it's negative 116 and below. So tell me what your, what, what's your threshold in that sense, and I can protect you. Do you care about the 99, 90th, 99, 50% tile? Now we can have an intelligent conversation of likelihood of interference, <clears throat> not just one over R squared kind of stuff. So. <laughs> And uh, so the future of spectrum sharing, the heads of all executive departments and agencies of the federal government said <laughs> very recently, since my dissertation, they said evidence-based decisions guided by the best available science and data. I think we're catching on. I think this language came out in 20, sorry, I don't have the citation, it's in the backup slide. Um, 2020, I think we're getting on the same page. If you present an argument that you want to project a service onto the electromagnetic spectrum, they'll say, oh, what about the FAA? What about the radio astronomy? What about, what about? Well, look, I've demonstrated evidence-based field measurements is a good example of that. <clears throat> and my decisions guided by the best available science and data, standards-based testing, which they don't do <laughs> to this day. Measurement measured. <clears throat> data and treatment of the uncertainties and variabilities. So <clears throat> use well-established scientific processes. Measurement uncertainty practices have been around since the 50s and peer review and feasible are appropriate. So this is new, we're coming around, we're catching up to where I recommended. And uh, this is just an example, I, I'm actually gonna throw this in the, uh, but there are standards for spectrum coexistence testing. You can just model it. That's one type of way of doing it. But you know, include those variabilities, uncertainties, and measure data wherever you can. You can measure it over cables, or you put some equipment over cables, or <clears throat> some over the air, which is its final place in the wild in situ, or over the air testing, where you'd have the least controllability of a test, but it's the most real world, but you can't control the um, Confounders. Cool. Um, I go till thirty. Is that right? I, I would leave a few minutes for questions. Right. Part. I could. Um, any questions on that measurement uncertainty and variabilities? I mean, we went many years in one half of a brief. This will be much shorter um, of a slide. But any questions online or in the room? I have, so you also look into the physical basis for the variability? Do I look into the physical basis for the yeah. variability? You know, you know if you want to get out of the future, you want to have a spin on the display. Yes. Uh, yeah, what, what caused those variations? Or let me do my walking test. There were no buildings there. Um, I did a test where I sat still and I just measured a base station. And every once in a while, analyzing the data, I saw this tiny little suck out in power, a tiny little suck out. It was only three or five dB, but it seemed somewhat periodic, sometimes closer together, but kept happening. And then I realized between me and the base station I was measuring is a road with a bunch of 18 wheelers on it. And if they're going 40 miles an hour, it took 1.3 seconds for them to pass. And the suck outs I was measuring from three dB to three dB was 1.4, 1.6 seconds. So I could see just traffic and it wasn't blocking it. It was just going underneath. It was changing the ground bounce in that case. But 
but yeah, so um, almost, I, I'll say almost flippantly, what do I care as long as I've modeled it? What do I, sorry, what in the city made these variabilities so bad? They actually go above one over R, R squared, you'll see, because I'm walking between buildings, down hallways of buildings, and those signals, this is just a CW tone, so it's additive. I'm receiving the tone directly. I'm receiving it as it bounces off buildings, as it comes from the sky and back down. Um, so all that multi-path, those different paths that they took could be additive as well, right? So constructive, destructive, it's all interference. Um, if I'd use a time domain signal that wait for the echoes to go down, I would have gotten different results and been able to gate them out of the system as well. So. Good point. Is this me sitting on my cell phone and it's got to go through that part of my torso? I don't know. But it's what will happen in the wild and it should be considered because that's what you'll receive in situ in the wild. <clears throat> cool. Any other questions on that previous material? Yeah, sure. Can we go back to the slide with the vision on this one? Okay. Um, I'm curious about the, the field measurements part that you have. Yeah, um, what's what's baked inside this block right here? Yeah. You're asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just curious about so is it is it just what you were showing on the previous slide? Yeah, with the bubbles. I'm oh, sorry. That's it. Do you look at this distribution? That's right. I took those data and and modeled it. And uh, I think this one was MATLAB. You can actually, if you have the statistics toolbox, you'll say. Um, oh, shoot, stat, value, starting number, type of Gaussian or uniform or chi-squared or whatever, yeah. comma, um, the standard deviation, and just say run it in a for loop, yeah. I see, so, so it sounds to me like what you're suggesting with this is with a set of field measurements, mm -hmm. then you can go to the FCC and say, with some certainty, Above right. 99%. So I guess maybe my my question is uh -huh. if you if someone's trying to make some policy about controller existence or something like that, is it is it typically that the the new entrant that's mm -hmm. trying to get access to that spectrum mm -hmm. is is saying I do they is the problem formulated like this with um I need to have access to the spectrum at above a certain uh, yeah, uh, so a new entrant would propose to the FCC, yeah. um, I want to use this band, maybe it's adjacent to someone, and I'm talking about the shoulder power as the roll-off happens. So they're like, um, if you just use simple math without measure, uh, measurement uncertainty, zero to the amp, minus 0.1 because of the cable, plus 10 because of the amplifier, and your answer is 134 dB loud, right? Or negative 134 dBm. That's how loud it will be. And, and that's what the person proposing is saying, hey, I'm yeah. going to be transmitting, and, and no one will hear anything about In this example, negative 134 is 4 dB below your negative 130 floor that you said in your policy before. That, that type of conversation would happen. But with measurement uncertainty applied to it, and I'm telling you that I think that's 97.5, but uh, yeah, 95th percent confidence it's going to be between negative 151 and negative 118. That's a much better answer. I see. So you're saying that the 134 is misleading the yeah. policy makers. 134 by itself is misleading. It's not a complete sentence, and, and I argue. I see. And, and it seems like that distribution mostly relies on your field measurement, right? <clears throat> yes, exactly. That's the yeah. dominant would be the path loss. Um, and this is just a simple example. If it was a radar, it'd be path loss twice, right? And and the surface area, and the surface area of a plane is different if it's flying away from you or the broad side of it, include that. Or it's a spin-stabilized satellite, yeah. with very directional antenna, and it has antenna wobble, model that. So when I say measurement uncertainty, you know, it's going to be 300 Kelvin to 350 Kelvin in its environment, model that. So this was just a simple example. I appreciate the question. Yeah, I think I follow Thank you. Cool. All right, hearing nothing else online, 
we're in the room. I'll go on real quick. Smart contracts for spectrum sharing. Bottom line up front again, let's see that. Um, as technologies improve and the request for new services or new entrants to the spectrum build up and up and up, um, we're this exponential growth could be solved by a new concept that I did not go over before called dynamic spectrum or dynamic system access. What I want to do is ask if I can access the spectrum or not. I can tell the battery just died on this. You can still hear me. <laughs> Whew. But their microphone's different. I'll try to speak up a little bit if I can <laughs> with this call. <cold. laughs> Um, uh, yeah, dynamic spectrum access is more of a, my radio is so sophisticated, I'm going to look at a set of radio use policies or rules or look at the spectrum conditions before I transmit. Like a simple soldier radio in this case would, I hit push to talk, it looks to see if the channel I'm set to is available. By available, I mean, are there other emitters there? That's all I can really measure, measure. And if it's vacant, I'll start talking over it. But to me, it's all one millisecond. You can't tell this is happening. If it's occupied, we're going to reconvene on our backup channel, our secondary or tertiary channel. So meet you over there. Or open up your other radios listening or scanning, if you will, because I can't use F1, frequency one anymore, because it's occupied. I'm going over to frequency two. That's a dynamic spectrum schema. But I'm proposing, and that's been around for a little while, it's hard to treat policy-wise, but not too bad technology-wise. It exists in Ethernet, um, collision avoidance, et cetera. But add to that, not only is the spectrum vacant, or I'm in an area where F1, F3, F5 can be used, and over here F2, F4, F6 can be used. Um, add to that schema a smart contract negotiating method as well. There are real time contracts, real time. When you click on something in Google, for example, you an ad will compete for your click through a smart contract and they'll negotiate it as soon as you click it. So I'm proposing the same sort of schema could apply to spectrum access as well. <clears throat> we will change the terms to the spectrum access policy in real time. And that'll give us multi-tiered licensing architectures to fill those white spaces. And I'll show you what white spaces are in the next slide. But um, we just had a visit at Hat Creek Radio Observatory, and they're just listeners of the spectrum. They use it, but only by staring at a celestial body and listening to it. They have a lot of downtime. And when I'm driving by their facility, I could ask permission. I think I could use this spectrum for a moment to call home and tell my wife I'm late. Um, so you could negotiate those things and two different users or two different carriers that came at the same time, they could bid on that spectrum. And the, and the winner would owe Hat Creek Radio Observatory some cash for accessing that spectrum. A millicent like the uh, ad clips, right? <clears throat> so white spaces, white spaces. Yeah, so dynamic spectrum access what that says on top, supposedly. Um, it's an architecture that exploits white spaces. So the times I'm not using the spectrum, other users could fill in that space. <clears throat> so the, where's my colors? Yeah, there's license user activity here. Um, one example I like to give is the elementary school in your neighborhood uses the spectrum during school day and at 3.30, they don't use it anymore. You could use it at home to watch your Netflix movies. That's That's the kind of, that would be a time epoch of like hours and hours, but these could be milliseconds in depth of time as well. As soon as you hang up your phone call, someone else wants to use it. So different carriers could negotiate access to the same frequency bands. They don't currently do this. That's why cell towers have rows and rows of antennas because they don't do this. <laughs> they have different bands of frequencies that they use. <clears throat> so fill in those white spaces by detecting them and then negotiating use of them. So an example in the literature, and I'm not an expert at blockchain and um, smart contracts in general, but it's um, uh, it's a concept that I've read about anyway, and I proposed it to the DOD of using it 
for their test ranges when they're not flying airplanes and testing tanks and things like that, negotiate. FAA can fly over there now because it's quiet time and they can do their air safety um, broadcasts. Uh, cell towers can turn on at certain times when the Defense Department is not using those spectrum or fielding those tests. <clears throat> so real-time changes to service level agreements. So this is just in general, what is blockchain? Um, cryptocurrency uses blockchain and cryptocurrency could be the means of transactions in the schema I'm talking about. So it's, it's just a way of securing the entire transaction or it could be done with real money um, just on a billing uh, basis. But So blockchain technology used in conjunction with DSA could maximize the utilization of spectrum. And in 1959, Nobel Prize winning Ronald M. Coase says, the purpose of spectrum management is to maximize the use. And so that in my parlance would be fill in those white spaces as best you can. So um, coordinating, <coughs> treating those spectrum blocks as blocks that can be negotiated terms and um, have um, competing users bid on them with IP based secured data transfer mechanisms. Another reason to use um, blockchain, to my understanding, is um, you'll have a nice audit trail of everything. So if a user accessed the spectrum and ruined a radio observatory experiment, there will be an audit trail. You can't go backwards and mess with uh, a smart contract if you use blockchain technology. <clears throat> Cool. So this is just in summary, a contract between the primary user, like the radio observatory would be the primary in the case I gave, and the secondary user, or the elementary school would be the primary user, secondary user would be the neighborhood around it, access those particular frequency blocks, and, and where's my diagram below? <laughs> oh no, I think I lost it. I'll check the backup, I'm sorry. So I have an implementation of it, it's just a bunch of blocks pointing at each other. <laughs> Let me describe it. Um, so the primary user in the, in the diagram is a bunch of acronyms. So I define them here, primary user, secondary user, data sets, bidding structure, including the graphic of how fees could be transferred uh, and negotiated. And all of them serve as all users, even a radio observatory or in the elementary school, use it as a receiver, will serve as DSA sensors listening to, recording, adding to the audit trail, spectrum activity in that band. You would know what user is accessing it by the recorded sensors. So distributed sensing would be necessary for this scheme as well. And I owe you guys a diagram. <laughs> I'm gonna find it right now. Great, so that's all I had on that. <clears throat> And I'll show you that in a second, some of the references and resources. So I did fly through um, that and we have 10 minutes or so. Um, I'll field any more questions you had on that material or if you thought of a new one for the first material I showed. Um, I'm open to anything. Questions online in the room? So I'm gonna walk up here and I'm gonna give people a second. I'm gonna turn this on. No, battery died. The battery died. Yeah. Well, they can hear up here, right? <laughs> yeah. All right, gang, this is Kevin Gifford. I was just gonna give you a couple minutes to stock up on your questions. I'm gonna make um, three comments uh, that are kind of related here. First, this will date people. Ken, you'll probably get this one. Um, so uh, you guys remember uh, LBJ's wife's name? Okay, that's, that's, I just wanted to see if people remembered that. Um, the second thing, um, on uh, the distributed ledger part for smart contracts, um, I heard this observation from NSF, and I'm just passing it along. Uh, they don't like saying the word blockchain because of the negative connota connotation of the energy expenditure. They like to say distributed ledger. It was just something I thought I would pass along. Uh, they were fairly sensitive to that. Um, the third thing is I'm actually going to regale you guys with Mark's, the results of Mark's thesis just for once, one minute while you guys are thinking of questions. So um, it was back uh, about uh, 2012. It was GPS, right? Very critical defense-oriented system. And Legato or Light Squared 
wanted to access a band that was next to GPS. And of course, all the military immediately said, you're going to interfere with us, right? And of course, you know, typically the response is, hey, it's the DOD, it's the military, we're not going to take that battle on. Um, but that ended up going through up to the Supreme Court. And it was two weeks after Mark did his thesis, which essentially said, you guys cannot substantiate the claim that you're making harmful interference because you can't measure it to that level. And it was just that probabilistic assessment. But it truly, guys, this is not an overstatement, although it may seem like Kevin's exaggerating. This is not an overstatement. The work in Mark's thesis on that probabilistic uncertainty assessment of spectrum overturned that billion dollar light squared GPS decision and uh, uh, two weeks later. And, and so you'll see on my door, uh, Mark uh, has an email that says, holy crap, Kevin, my thesis is at the White House. That really was two weeks after Mark's uh, dissertation. But I think Mark would say himself, it really was pro applying probability and eliminating measurement uncertainty. And once the argument was framed in that context, it was going to be hard to beat that argument. So um, I'm looking, see, I just wanted to regale people for a couple minutes and really give some actuality to that work. Um, I'm going to look and see if there's any other thing in the chat. Um, so I don't have anything else in the chat. I was going to see if any hands went up in the chat, but um, since no questions there, any other questions in the room for Mark? on these topics okay mark, mark. What, the, what do you think the feasibility is for the smart contracts for it with respect to what we need to do to actually like be deployed and tested what what's the feasibility of that smart contracts um theorem uh, as applied to dsa at this point well dsa is having a hard time rolling out i fielded 23 DC, dsa radios in 2006-7 and it solved all the radio controlled IED problems was the goal of the test. It was a DARPA project at the time. And it's still, there's still no policy language that can support it. We're still in that stacked users um, spectrum chart. Oh boy, that wasn't very smooth. <laughs> we still have this, how do you implement a playground, you know, a big blue space or something where you can try DSA first. So what's the feasibility of applying those smart contracts? I think it has to be demonstrated. I think that, you know, even over the cable, you know, how configurable are the SDRs we have? Could we mess with a CBRS three and a half gigahertz um, 5G radio system to implement something about who can access that? And the technology is there for those types of contracts for ad tracking and things like that. It does exist. You know, it's the simplest idea is, is the application of already existing technologies, right? So hard for me to predict because I haven't seen DSA take off very well as, uh, as its own access method. So let's, let's do it in the lab. That's what I propose. <laughs> Another question in the back, go ahead. Would smart contracts be um, usable for enforcement? I definitely think that audit trail is a great spectrum forensics tool of who accessed it when. And um, the example I gave earlier, and I just flew through it, was um, a radio observatory has that type of system, schema implemented and instantiation of it, and they have some bad data one day. It's like, was well, it bad data because I forgot to turn on a switch or someone negotiated a contract improperly and accessed the spectrum? Let's check the tape. Let's check the record. So that's my idea there, that enforcement could definitely be a byproduct of that. Another question? Go ahead. So there's with the distributed ledger. Distributed ledger, uh-huh. 
How fast could a, a smart contract be negotiated across a distributed network? Yeah, you can say it. How long is the chain <laughs> in time in units of milliseconds or? Yeah, basically, how long is this session? It's a function of number of bidders, of course, and I foresee the use or use cases that only I can think of, and I'm not the source. I need you guys to tell me use cases. Um, it might just be one bidder, and that's it. If two competing two competing bidders, if um, around an entire uh, test range was the example I gave, and commercial traffic wants to access any point of that. There could be a bunch of contracts, but they don't necessarily, they're not bidding against each other because they're spatially separated. So I, I, I'm going to say it's a function of number of, of bidders. And um, uh, I, mean, I get what I was actually asking. Mm -hmm. you take cryptocurrency, you make the transaction cryptocurrency, and it takes a while for it actually. A cryptocurrency transaction currently takes a while to process. So if we need to be second level negotiations, so if you have to say, mm -hmm. try to come to the yeah. 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 It's plus or minus 30 degrees of a satellite going over a yeah. facility, and I need to negotiate that contract and, 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 and give access before that window and the thing's moving 11,000 miles an hour, you're saying? <laughs> right, so could such a schema be reconciled in that time epoch? Yes. I don't know, let's test it. <laughs> right now, the, the ads that you click on from Google, the ad trackers, the things like that, they're negotiated in milliseconds. So what is the difference? I don't know. Let's research it. Another question in the back, go ahead. An incumbent bid yeah. on the spectrum? Does the telecom company bid on behalf of the new entrant, the user in that regard? Yes, that would speed things up. That would be a way of, I'm the seller doing the entire transaction and the buyer just... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And the comment was, as a user of Spectrum, I want to have service everywhere I go, and it's worth a little extra money to me. So I'll show you release 18 of uh, 3GPP, which has supplemental coverage from space, SCS. The non-terrestrial networking is going to work, and they're going to charge you differently for it. So exactly. <laughs> so there might be other solutions to give you the service that you want. Starting first with emergency services and then going to texting and data and what have you. But yeah, great comment. Okay, I think I'm done because I'm all right, gang. 25 um, seconds over. Yeah, well, 45 seconds is fine. Let's give Mark a big round of applause for the presentation. Yeah. Thanks for the questions um, in the room and for attending online. Um, uh, I think this is over. Uh, Corey, I wasn't quite sure if you were going to stay on. If I see you stay on, then we'll set something up with Mark. <laughs> but please uh, feel free to do what you want to do. And uh, thanks again, everyone, for attending. Uh, please give feedback on candidate uh, Dr. Mark Lofquist if you have time and appreciate your attendance. Thanks, everyone. Bye now. Ciao.